Thank you so much there. Alice Schulte is our tech expert who's helping us today. She's doing the recording um, and is going to monitor the chat pod and fill in any um, tech support that you guys need help with as we have our session today. Welcome to Member Spotlight. My name is Tamara Averett, and I'm joined here today with Lisa Lahneman. Uh, she is our a newer member that we're featuring um, in our Member Spotlight. And the spotlight is intended to showcase uh, WAHI members as a way to continue our association's communication and membership connections. It's a way for us to share some personal stories and uh, inspirational stories around life's work and uh, our journeys today. Um, we're gonna have Lisa and I will have a conversation about some questions that we've negotiated up front. And then if you've got specific questions you want for Lisa, put them in your chat pod and we'll get them asked to Lisa as we go. Um, the chat pod is up. We've got your, um, what I would ask is everybody to mute. So the only person I think right now that's unmuted is uh, Diane and Marcy. So Marcy, if there's a way that you can just mute, we're not gonna get any background um, noise on. And Alice can also mute everybody, but it looks like we're all good to go on that front. We do have the live transcript running at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it translates really well. Other times it's gonna be like an 80% solution and you can have a good giggle about how it comes across, but um, hopefully that's helpful as well. Uh, my inspiration for volunteering to do this series was just the um, knowing and getting to know a lot of the incredible, awesome women that we have in our association. Um, also the second piece is sipping uh, a happy hour wine yeah. together with others. I always love doing that. And I always remember the door scotch ads that if you remember, you read Fortune magazine or something at the back of the page, it was always on the back. And it was like, you know, they would give you like four or five little tidbits about somebody that was being featured in, in the scotch. I was like, I, want, I think we could do something like that. And that could be kind of fun. And Betty said, okay, let's try that. And um, I always think like Dos Equis may have the most interesting man in the world, but Wahi has the most interesting women in the world. So that's what we're gonna find out about today. And today, our drink of choice is Pinot Noir. We're having our everyday brand of Mark West, and uh, it's just a great normal go-to. So here is Lisa. Uh, Hello. She happens to also be a shipyard neighbor, so I'm delighted that she was able to show up today and uh, help us out. Uh, Lisa is a newer Wahi member, having moved from Covington, Kentucky, uh, with her husband, Doug, and they're now full-time residents as of 2021 last year. Um, I know Covington well because I've flown in and out of the airport since my daughter lives in Cincinnati now, and uh, it's a lovely, That's it's a lovely wild. place. Lisa began her career working in public health at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and uh, over the course of her 41, 41 oh. year career, she's worked with Dr. Fauci on the HIV AIDS Coalition, worked to resolve a hepatitis A outbreak. Uh, tracing the disease back to patient zero, which we're all kind of, we all know what that means now after our COVID experience, and served as an invention, infection preventivist, preventionist. Pre Close. Okay, we'll get that when we come to that mm -hmm. plot, spot um, during the N1H1 outbreak and the appearance of the coronavirus and the early identification of it. She's got lots of experience in her career with resilience. Um, and has seen both heartbreaking and life-changing events through her different roles that she's held. So, Lisa, welcome to Thank Member you. Spotlight. We're Thank excited you. you're I'm here. Happy to be here. So, tell us about when did you join Wahi and why? I joined. I think it was June 21, and um, my husband was in a golf group. Who um, said, uh, "Had I joined anything? Met anybody?" And actually, it was a bunch of fellows. So. <gasps> How about that? Husband referrals. That's the first time I've ever heard of that. There you go. Go guys. Um, and what are you involved with, Wahi? Anything in water, I'm in. Um, love kayaking. Also pickleball. Um, some craft things. Golf. Okay. Awesome. Very good. We, um, I did meet her husband, Doug, and he was our featured guest artist last month with Wahi's Pinterest interest afternoon, and he helped us make these wonderful uh, sea glass mosaic um, sea creatures. And he was super in uh, helping everybody get that happen. So we appreciate him. How did you find your way to Hilton Head? Are you a Binya or a Kamya? As we have Gullah Month this month. Oh, where... well, uh, actually, it was Doug's family. Uh, we vacationed here quite a bit. 
then I honeymooned here. Ooh. And then um, really didn't talk much about retirement. And then I guess in, would that have been 19, um, some things changed and all of a sudden we started thinking about it and it just was the place we knew we wanted to be. Awesome. So well, we're glad you're here. Thanks. Here we go. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, Doug is her husband and yep. we like Doug quite a bit. He's very helpful. Um, let's see. Doug and I have been married. Uh, for, that's a terrible thing. I forgot the anniversary of last year. She was the 41 years. And um, he's a retired school administrator, kind of a Renaissance guy, artistic. Um, then we have our oldest daughter, Monica, is 32. She's a graphic designer, got that from her father. And she works in Cincinnati and she will be providing us with our first grandchild on April 14th. Woo! He shall be called Harrison. Wow. Yep. So that's already the called Han Solo, Indiana <laughs> Jones, Harry Potter. So we're thrilled about that. Then there's um, Allison, and she is 29. She's a pediatric dentist in Arlington, Virginia. And while you shouldn't pick favorites, we next come to Bear, our 13 and a half year old multi kid. Okay. Awesome. A dog lover as well. Yes. Yeah. So you started at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. I did. And there you were um, also serving on the HIV AIDS Coalition with Dr. Fauci. Actually, um, he comes in right after um, my transition into the public health system. But um, I went to Children's Hospital right after college and it was an incredible place to start. It's an internationally recognized children's hospital. So you get cases that are sent in from all over the world. I had just the incredible luck to be placed on the um, elective surgery floor. So it was pulling in cardiac cases from Africa. Oh my goodness. Um, Dr. Robin Cotton was a world renowned otolaryngologist. We had people coming in. Um, he was doing kind of groundbreaking polyp surgery. So it was just fascinating. And from a um, empowered female, I just really fit in with the fact that you could say to a doctor, you know, why are you doing this? Um, why did you hang that? Why are you ordering this? And I never had anyone be anything but gracious with their knowledge and sharing. And it, it was all I knew. I mean, it was just a, a really great experience. Um, then I got to be a part of a research group in otolaryngology doing some work with polyp removal. And you would go out to different hospitals to meet the patients that wanted to come to children. And I was first exposed to, um, I, I mean, they were physicians. <laughs> that uh, did not appreciate me asking them questions. Oh, so that was my first forte into being a person who might be said, well, you need, you can't ask that, you know, you need this. And it kind of helped me realize that, um, that as I progressed in my career, I would be comfortable being autonomous. I was an independent thinker. And I wasn't necessarily, which is, we need them, but I wasn't just a task-oriented person. So um, as I realized, um, my work in the private hospitals was not nearly as professionally satisfying as working at a large educational research institute. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty big self-awareness for in your 20s to have gone down that path. Did you have a specific mentor or somebody that was helping you through that process? I had several. I had um, a Dr. Crawford, which was, and it was interesting to me, the larger, it, this isn't always the case, but the more successful and the larger some of these um, physicians were, from, from my experience, they were more gracious. They were, um, you know, why don't you consider this? Or uh, there was a nephrologist that said, have you ever thought of public health? Even the pharmacy texts and things that would come up, 
I remember to this day one saying to me, um, if you ever have children, never give them Tylenol and um, or Advil alone. Always alternate. That'll come out years from now. But right now, this is or aspirin. You know, use aspirin for some things. But I think it's going to be hooked to rise syndrome. I mean, it was just. I mean, that's it was, awesome. It was. It was a great place to be at that point. But I knew that um, it also was heartbreaking because there. I mean, when there's a bad outcome with a child. And um, I was telling Tamara earlier, I tend to have a lot of empathic experiences and that was very crushing. Um, and also I saw a lot of these kids have diagnoses that I thought, you know, did this really have to be the outcome? What if there was an intervention earlier? Was there a way to prevent this? Or even, you know, their, their needs, you know, if, if the safety had been met or um, if they had had the proper nutrition. So um, it's kind of led me in the past to think, what if I could be a care provider at an earlier stage? Could I make a difference? More on the preventative side than the interventive side. Oh, correct. Yeah. And I, I felt like I um, had learned so much there and that led me into public health. Um, before I sound too altruistic, don't forget, you don't work weekends or holidays in public health either. So <laughs> that was a real perk. So you have a balanced, a, ba a more balanced yeah. approach I mean, to living. I mean, it was hard. It was hard. I, I look back on some of those experiences and I think there were so many children that were alone in the hospital with painful things going on. Do they have like a Ronald McDonald house or family care thing that families could come in and be with them? They had a Ronald McDonald house. I think it's progressed. Um, I hear people talk about uh, grandmothers going in and holding nursing babies, but back then there was a lot of, I remember the sickle cell anemia. Mm. Um, a lot of those kids were in terrible pain and I remember feeling just sick that I, I had other responsibilities and they were alone. Yeah. And that became a very challenging. So it helped me realize um, there were some other things that um, I wanted to accomplish. So you made your career, career transition. I did. Over out of like the nursing care piece. Correct. Into the public health piece. And is that where you got involved with the HIV AIDS? It was. Initially, when you get in, you have to get a sound um, practice with all the clinics. There was um, family planning, prenatal, sexually transmitted diseases, vaccines, vaccines for travel. Um, and I worked in all the clinics, tuberculosis, tried to get a good sound base. And then I um, found myself, uh, I always loved epidemiology, which is the study of the prevalence, the incidence, and the control of disease, which is, um, there was an opening for epidemiology and control of communicable disease for five counties. And that's what I ended up in. And as soon as I took it, um, all of a sudden you started hearing about these um, patients with AIDS, HIV related issues. And unfortunately, in the beginning, so many of them were um, homosexual and there was so little being done for them. We had a lot in our clinics, uh, we tried to work together with Cincinnati. It would be like where I was located would be like Bluffton and Hilton Head. You were separated by the Ohio River. So we were trying to work together to see what was going on. And it just was floundering. So many of these um, men were being left without treatment options, testing options. And all of a sudden we got word that um, there was a Dr. Anthony Fauci who was coming up and he wanted to work um, with us to see what we could do, engaging in with Cincinnati and see if we could find a way to generate some interest for people to see this disease differently. So he, come, uh, he came up to Northern Kentucky and we met and it was such an honor. I mean, I was only in the room a short time and he was brilliant, compassionate, kind and his total focus was let's educate people that this is not just a small and if it was 
where is our humanity caring about, you know, helping people and getting this on? Although he also was very strong and it was a bloodborne illness. So there's a lot of other people that were going to come in the picture, hemophilia, uh, prenatal patients, the babies, breastfeeding mothers. And he was trying to generate interest to get more people to quit focusing on the homosexual. The one lifestyle issue that left a group of our, our public suffering unnecessarily. So I admired greatly that he was so compassionate and he went to all the clinics, worked the clinics, met the people, got their input, and really made a huge difference by forming a coalition that he drew attention by his actions. It, it, yeah. His actions brought a, a, a tremendous change in our area. So he was absolutely wonderful. Ironically, there was a parallel when I saw him on TV with coronavirus trying to tell people, I mean, when you ask an ex expert, what can we do to, to help? And they give you an answer. And then people say, man, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't like that answer. I don't like that answer. That answer's hard. Yeah. So um, he was very, very diligent and gracious. And it was a very positive experience. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So um, you also, as part of public health, were part of a contact tracing event down to patient zero. What was that experience like? Because you know we've all followed coronavirus and contact, contact tracing. tracing. You may or may not have been contact traced. We've all heard about patient zero, right, in China? Yeah, yeah. So what was that experience like? Um, you know, I just want to backpedal because I forgot in public health, you also work with the environmentalists to follow up on foodborne outbreaks or, or animal-related things. So it was fascinating that the SARS- Like lettuce problems. Yeah. Like Syria. romaine, romaine <laughs> palm. Let us yeah. not be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, and we did a lot of uh, restaurant inspections together when there was an illness to follow up on. And the hospitals reported to this division. So you, you go in the hospital, you have a diarrhea illness, it goes to the health department, and then we start the investigation. So um, it was fascinating because there was a banquet at an upscale restaurant, and hepatitis A is a fecal oral, whereas C and B hepatitis are blood. So it makes a difference because it takes about 30 days, which is very challenging to, to have to look at something and go back 30 days because everybody who gets anything thinks it occurred yes, last weekend. So we, all, we traced this, these hepatitis cases to uh, this restaurant and we knew that it had to have been a server or a cook because it was fecal oral. And then once that started, it just took so many turns because you had to make sure you stayed focused because of course, somebody in a household has hepatitis, other people are gonna get it, but that doesn't help you find patient zero if it disseminates through the community. So um, the next thing that we, so we go down and interview people on, you know, you'd find them wherever you could and discuss with them where they ate, who they've been in contact with, and then we had another restaurant have an outbreak. And that was concerning because it, again, dilutes the focus that people are like, you know, do something about this or this. And then a break came when um, there was a children's home that several children became ill. And then the whole place was um, positive. And I had remembered that some of the cooks at the initial restaurant said, um, and this is how, how deep you have to drill, that uh, you'd say, tell me your contact. And they had named a contact that they had bought marijuana from, who had a certain name that several of these kids shared the same name. Oh. So I went to the children's home and was able to talk to the kids. And sure enough, there was a name there. Unfortunately, they didn't know where he was. They were removed from the home. And then a couple people from another cluster who all of a sudden, so you had to ask these people. She's like a, a mystery solver, a it detective. Is. You know, but when I was little, I loved Quincy. Now that I got into it, I was like, he should have never been out of that lab. I was all about murder, she wrote. Yeah, oh yeah. Angela Lansbury, all God bless her. All she was them. the best. All of them. But it's funny because you look and think, hmm, she should have been doing that. But it was really fascinating because more people and you have to go sometimes 
you know, in the evening, in a comfortable spot, because a lot of people don't want to tell you that they're smoking pot. But we found that this fellow was selling pot out of a hearse that he lived in. Oh my gosh. So um, I went down in the evening and tried to find I'm out where he was going to be. And I met this guy and oh, immediately, if you know, it's fecal oral, it's hand hygiene as a part of it. And he was as nice as he could be. I was very, I mean, you have to be non-threatening in your investigatory process. But I said, you know, we're just trying to find out. And I said, and number one, have you been sick? And he said, I have never been sick a day in my life. He turns around and looks at me. His eyes are bright yellow. <laughs> And I was like, I think you might have hepatitis, but the end result was this was patient zero and he was rolling joints for people to sample the product oh, with. And know. when I said, the, you know, about hand wash, he goes, I wash my hands all the time. And I'm like, living in a hearse. Yeah. I don't think so. Oh my goodness. So it was really cool to go all that way and have to filter out all the cases that the public is irate about and right. focused on and really just keep focused on tracking back to there. But it, it was- Well, I have to say after our um, shared coronavirus uh, pandemic experience, I have a totally deep and abiding appreciation of public health experts and the people that work in that field and the whole contact tracing process and and uh, how you how you figure all that out. So thank you for all of those things You're that you've done. You appreciate welcome. that. Um, so then you also did home visitation with infants, right? My career in uh, communicable disease lasted for a very long time, and it was fascinating. Um, during that time, there was a um, a huge gonorrhea outbreak that was uh, penicillin resistant. And I think um, I found out about, somebody mentioned it, a, a retirement facility in Florida. I was like, where is this place? It kind of started that, but you know, it kind of weighs on you. It's a, it's a unique focus. Yes. I think I shared a story that my mom was telling me I was getting um, jaded and she came to meet me for lunch and there was a prisoner coming out. And um, I was like, mom, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, hey, Lisa, he's all shackled and he had been a patient. And she goes, you need a job soon. <laughs> so, um, and that's the great thing about public health. There's absolutely no room for stagnation, absolutely none. So um, they, uh, I started asking to work more, the prenatals, and I had always home visited. It was a gift. I had always home visited, which is Anybody can look a certain way in a, in a clinic setting, but when you go into the home. So I transitioned to uh, prenatal, high-risk prenatal and infants. And um, I'll just say now that included SIDS follow-up as well. And um, that was one of those things where, you know, it was bittersweet. You did a lot of work to help people, you hope, um, get through the pregnancy and find resources. Um, and it had a lot of joy, but there was a lot of heartache to see some of the people who were going to be parents. Yeah, not ready, not ready to be a parent. Not ready. And I had the one that sticks out is a patient that I went in to see in the hospital and I was um, talking about breastfeeding and safety and she was very upset and she said, I just can't believe the hospital named my patient. And I said, hospitals don't name your, I mean, her child. And I said, hospitals don't name your child. And she was truly distraught. And she said, they did because it's on her bracelet and it's all over the paperwork. And I said, I need to look at that. I don't understand. And she goes, they have called her Famali. And it was, she saw female. Oh my goodness. All over the, the records. And it was heartbreaking to think, this was going to be parent, a parent. Yeah. So I mean, you know, you, you get that to the appropriate resources, but it was hard. That was a challenge. Oh my goodness. Um, so you also then went and worked with the large healthcare system for N1H1 outbreak. And I, I remember the swine flu because we had to line up at the high school gym and we all got flu misted. Really? Yes. I actually, our oldest daughter got N1H1 at college. Oh. But 
and that was terrible. It was, you know, another thing of seeing something firsthand, but that was um, one of the first times it's because I stayed in it this long that you saw another of people's response and the concern because it was a variant. You know, it was something that changed and a lot of people still have an attitude about flu shots, although, you know, they're, they're recommended for a certain group. So you had a lot of contact tracing there where you found colleges, different things, but it kind of was a precursor. Then came Ebola and that brought in um, a huge team of people to say, this is what's going on. These people are, you know, we have a couple cases here moving in. So it kind of, if you look back on it, there were so many iterations that are coming, foreshadowing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah foreshadowing that yeah. process. Did you ever think that you would see in America 500 million rapid tests, um, uh, 400 million N95 masks being sent out to the American public? I wish I could say no, but the answer is yes. Oh, the answer is yes. It just, just the resistance or, you know, you mentioned contact tracing with COVID or any of the respiratory, you tried to explain to people that, um, it, well, even now there's six feet and you would try to explain, you know, it's the particle size, how far you can spread it. I mean, there's some things that you're not going to cough out, but practice good cough etiquette. And it just was met with resistance for some reason. Um, it almost feels like now looking back that the plan was set for something Else. to happen. Yeah. So what do you think was the best thing about being the public health professional? You did it in a lot of different settings. You've seen a lot of different things. What was the best part of being about being a public health professional? The person that it helped me become in regards to seeing people for who they are and hopefully not prejudging or an example would be um, part of the job earlier was educating like the SIDS work, um, going to talk to people with SIDS that it used to be called sudden infant death, but then they said sudden infant um, undetermined death. But, you know, I, I found myself being judgmental if there was somebody that shaken baby syndrome and I was like, oh, I can't believe you took and then later you find here's a, a 20 year old person who has no support, is working, comes home and a baby's, I mean, I had a colicky baby. And, you know, I remember one time that's putting, tough. It is. And Doug ran in and said, I'll take over, I'll take over. And I started thinking, you know, where's the support? Where's our community helping? So I think it really helped me see people um, hopefully in a different light. Look at people holistically. That's awesome. I like that you uh, you bring up your empathetic side also because clearly you are. And it was a big joke with uh, with different groups that I was affiliated with that I had to learn how to. I had to learn how to be a hugger because oh. I grew up on the business side of the thing, and we were not huggers. We were handshakers. And then I went and I worked in with some social work folks and I had to learn how to hug. And so that was, yeah. So I appreciate the uh, empathetic comment there. It's a vice and a virtue. Yes. So what would you, uh, what advice would you give your younger self? You know what, when you shared that question, I thought, I don't think my younger self would have listened to much, but I had to give, so I'd like to turn it around because I think my younger self would look at my older self and say, wow. What a ride. Yeah. You know, it's been absolutely awesome. But through several recent life lessons and my younger self, I think the message would be looking forward. Don't forget to be grateful. Make sure that you pull the gratitude card every day and just appreciate. I mean, look where I am. Look at all the things that have happened. And I just think reminding me to be grateful. Then if any of you were at the Mingle and Jingle or the Lantern Parade, you might be confused by this, but also I need to dance more. <laughs> and props to Wendy Posey for giving me a 30 second dance button that makes me remember. But you know, it's 
it's so short and you don't know. So find your joy, right? Find your joy. Find your joy, find wherever your joy that is. And spread that joy. And do it every day. Every day, find your joy. Um, what advice would you give young women working in your pub in the uh, public health industry today? You know, um, that's a great question because I found in some circum circumstances that very few uh, graduating nurses choose public health. Um, so I would say make sure that you explore all avenues, find what your interest is, and then give it 110% because the return is going to be immense. Awesome. Okay. So we've got some, you guys can be thinking uh, out there, any questions that you may have for Lisa and putting them in the chat pod. We've got some rapid fire questions now for her <laughs> um, as she takes a sip of wine. Yeah, Here we go. Drinky. So do you have a best friend? I have the same best friend since I was four years old and we're as different as night and day, but it's just awesome. And is the best friend in Northern Kentucky? She is in Wilmington, North Carolina. Oh my, relocated? Yes. But a long time ago, her husband works for GE. And was, oh, very yeah, good. Very, that's, that's fun. Um, what was the last book you read? The Art, the Art of the Short Game by Stan Utley. Golf. A golf book. I love that. <laughs> that's Did awesome. it help me? No. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite drink? Oh, uh, boy. Do I have to just unsweet nice tea, wine. And I love a Bloody Mary. Oh. But it's hard to find unsweet and iced tea down here. You have to, you have to ask it. for it. Yeah. Everything's sweet. Charleston mix, that's my favorite go to Bloody Mary mix. It's is very it? good. Charleston mix, bold and spicy. Love bold and spicy. Uh, what is your favorite travel destination outside of Hilton Head? Uh -huh, sure. Uh, Italy. Any specific part? Northern, Southern? Um, Sorrento, Positano. Oh, lovely. Yeah. The the beach, the water. Water. Yeah, the there water. you go. Yeah. Lot of hills. Um, what is your favorite thing to do in Hilton Head outside of play golf? Uh, swim. In um, the ocean? In the ocean, in the pool at Evian. Yeah. Um, and kayak. And I'm really big in pickleball. Okay. Yeah. So active, active sports. Um, do you have a, what are you binge watching today? I'm not a TV girl, but I'm going to tell you, um, something about James Spader is interesting to me. So Blacklist and Boston Legal at the same time. That's quite a, quite a spectrum there. Old school. Okay. So does anybody have, oh, we have one, uh, Alice has a comment here. Part of Lisa's story is making me think of Call the Midwife. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Does anybody have a question they'd like to unmute themselves and ask Lisa or put it in the chat pod? This is your time. I think she did a great job covering the water of 41 years, 41 years yeah. of, of uh, professional work experience and all of the different things that she did along the way. I never really had a lot of exposure to public health professionals. So it was really interesting to hear Good. that that part of what you did. You know, one of the things um, was the um, the infant death, uh, death task force. And I, I really encourage people to get involved. And in, like I said about um, if there's any hospitals or areas that you can volunteer to help. hold somebody or help because I mean, at that time they started that because the the infant death rate was so high and people are kind of, there was a lot more information about. So one of the evidence. programs in my professional work life was um, called the New Parent Support Program. And because of, with military families, they had younger parents. They had a lot of parents that were single parenting because of deployments of service members. So the new parent support program would be home visitation uh, after with a newborn to teach basic parenting skills and interventions. And it really went after the issue of uh, domestic violence, child abuse, early prevention and intervention. And it was, awesome. it was super effective. So home visitation, new parent skills, super important. And it's, it's wild because now Monica's pregnant and she'll say things like, no mom, you can't have soft, you know, stuff. No bedding. Like, yeah, no bedding. And, but it was, it was a transition to see um, how many changes were made. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So we don't have any questions coming okay. in. I had one, Tamara. Oh, okay. 
if you had to pick one of the biggest stretches, stretch assignments or stretch experiences you had in your career, Lisa, what would it be? Probably uh, creating the infant fatality task force to look at, um, that was a stretch for me. I was a mother of two children. It definitely affected my parenting. Um, and to, to recognize or to see the statistics of how many children's deaths that weren't investigated until then were called accidents or uh, SIDS. And then you look at them and, you know, it was um, a Commonwealth attorney, a, a detective, the coroner, myself, and you looked at the cases and you realized that wasn't what was happening. So that was a stretch in every aspect of, of my being. And it definitely affected me. Positively. Personally, yeah. Personally and positively. Yeah. Well, and, and my kids, I, if they were going somewhere and they'd say, mom, this person can't pick us up yet. I'd be like, I'll be right there. I mean, I just learned a little bit about evil and also that things happen and just because it was infants and it was, nobody knew about it. You know, it was kind of like, oh, they died as kids, but did they? Yeah. When you went and interviewed the people you found, and, and many of those, I'm not saying, but some were, you know, it yeah. just felt like there was a, a part of our, our population that wasn't getting the attention that. You know, sometimes a little sunshine on something is all that's needed to make things start moving forward in a more positive direction. Yeah, that was definitely the most challenging. Even above coronavirus, and that was, wow. That's a wow. To be an in infection control in that time. <laughs> well, we're glad that Lisa's retired to Hilton Head, is playing golf and finding joy in her day. Um, we are appreciative of her story, background, life experiences, and sharing that today with us. Uh, we appreciate that as a newer Wahi member, she stepped right out and did this interview when I asked. That's pretty bold, and I appreciate her stepping up to do that. Um, we're going to feature other interesting members in the next several weeks to come, um, showing the wide range of backgrounds and breadth and depth. We've got uh, Sue Grossback coming up on February 28th. She has a uh, educational um, administration background. She's a French and German speaker. So uh, we're gonna parlay or second. I'm not quite sure what one we're gonna do. I do neither of those languages. So it will be in English. Um, the other ones coming up are Claudia Auer on, on March 7th. And then we've got Jane McAuliffe on March 21st. Um, so if you're interested in member spotlight, if you're interested in being a host of a member spotlight, reach out to me and let me know who you would like to nominate or step in and do interviews. Um, we appreciate you uh, tuning in today. We're going to have a quick feedback survey that will hit your email block, uh, e -box, email inbox. Thank you. I've only had a half a glass of wine <laughs> and, um, and just give us a little bit of feedback because this was a new programming um, creation this year. And we wanna make sure that we're getting it right and asking questions that you're interested in as well. So um, with that, we're gonna say adieu to Lisa and Thank to you. all of you as well. Enjoy uh, Valentine's Day. Happy yeah. Valentine's Day. Thank you. All right, thanks all.